and you let me uh, you're gonna let me know if people are asking questions how does it work oh yeah i'll do i'll do a very brief introduction okay okay and, um i'll be monitoring the questions and i'll be yeah no mention to world cup please <laughs> I was in, in Germany in 2014, in September, to give a talk, and the introduction was painful. Yeah, can you imagine? So, hello everyone. We, we're going to wait a minute while the number of participants still increases, and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we can get started as more people come in. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the second session, to the second lecture of today's uh, session for the ICFO School. We have Professor Rafael Fernandez with us. Um, Rafael uh, did his PhD at the University of Campinas in Brazil, and then he spent some time uh, as a postdoc at Ames Laboratory and Columbia University in Los Alamos before moving to the University of Minnesota, where he has been since. And he's an expert on uh, theoretical condensed matter physics, electronic correlations of various uh, quantum materials. So I will ask you to please, you know, either raise your hand or type a question in the Q&A, and I will uh, then um, give you access, you know, allow you to talk and ask your question to Rafael. So Rafael, the floor is yours. Pablo, thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction. Thanks uh, for you and the organizers for inviting me to speak here in this uh, very nice school. So uh, I'll tell you about electronic pneumaticity in more super lattices. I'm going to try to do something a little bit different where I uh, combine this hybrid combination of slides and whiteboard and uh, let's see if uh, it works well. This is work supported by the DOE. So uh, my main focus of this uh, lecture will be the, this paper here, although I will include a lot of uh, introductory material. So this paper will appear now in Science Advances and it was uh, done in collaboration with uh, uh, Jorn Vanderbos from Drexel University. Uh, uh, some of the things I'll say here also uh, appear in this uh, uh, paper with the group of Pablo uh, uh, from MIT. And uh, I believe that he will talk more about this on his talk on Friday about this work. And so I will not be discussing that very extensively. So here's the plan. I want to first do a very quick uh, motivation of why I talk about electronic pneumaticity in twisted bilayer graphene. Then I will spend most of my talk here to just uh, an lecture style to introduce what is uh, pneumaticity and how it is affected by different crystal structures. And then the last part of the talk, uh, we will apply some of the things that I discussed uh, in point two to uh, more super lattices. So I know you've seen this a hundred times by now, but I just want to, uh, us to be on the same page. So uh, the key point here is just to show that if I take two graphene layers, I have a small twist, I, I perform a small twist angle here and uh, we get this uh, more super lattice. Uh, the twist angle is small. This is a very long uh, 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 lattice parameter. And you've seen the consequences of this to the electronic structure. Now, uh, the key point that I want to, to, to mention here is that this uh, is not a, a rigid lattice, but it is actually uh, an emergent super lattice. And this will be extremely important for what I say later. And by the way, please interrupt me at any time with questions, okay? So uh, here's another picture of the Moray super lattice. So uh, here to construct this, we put two, si the two sides of the two layers on top of each other, and then rotate by small angle. There is a, per there is a, a periodicity here. So AA stacking means that I have the two sides of the two uh, layers on top of each other. Uh, you see the form a triangular, uh, more, this, the, the Moray triangular super lattice. And in the center of the triangles, you have so-called AB or BA stacking. 
that's when the site of one of the layers coincides with the center of the hexagon of the other layers. Okay? Now, what's going to be very important uh, uh, are the symmetries here. And I want to spend a little bit more time on that. Okay? So uh, I'm going to be, I will talk a lot about these three symmetries. Okay? Let me just go over what this means, right? So when I say that I have a C6Z symmetry, it means that I have six-fold rotations, okay, are about the z-axis. So that's a symmetry of the problem. If I do uh, six-fold about z-axis, right, and that's what it means, uh, I get the same thing. And you can see it from here, right? If I take this point and I rotate by 60 degrees, I go here, it's the same point. This point here, the, 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 this black goes to, to blue, uh, these are two sublattices, but they're equivalent. If I have what's called valid symmetry, these remain equivalent points, okay? Uh, so this is one of the symmetries that's going to be important for us. The other two that I have listed here are C2X and C2I. C2X, as the name says here, is a two-fold symmetry with respect to the x-axis. So under this symmetry, you see that this point maps here, this one here maps here, and so on. I do not interchange sublattices, so I do not need valid uh, symmetry for this symmetry operation. Okay? And uh, the other symmetry, of course, that I have, oops, the other symmetry that I have here is, let me just uh, do this properly here. The other symmetry that I have here is C2Y. So I, I have your y axis and I rotate by 180 degrees. And you see again that I interchange sub lattices of the ABBA honeycomb lattice. Okay? So these are the symmetries that I would need to uh, use to discuss what comes next. Now, again, I'm sure you've seen this many times before, but uh, in the same note paper by Pablo's group, uh, we learned that uh, as you go across the so-called narrow bands of, uh, of twisted bilayer graphene, you get a very rich phase diagram. Specifically, what called everyone's attention was the existence at uh, 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 a feeling of NS over 2 uh, of a correlated insulating phase shown here. Okay? And more interestingly, or as interestingly, uh, if you dope a little bit away or if you uh, change your carrier concentration away from the correlated insulating phase, you see these two superconducting domes. So, so you buy now. Yeah. Um, there is a question. So I'm going to ask uh, Rafael uh, Gontijo to please ask the question. Let me just go to him. And go back. Rafael, I allow you to talk. Hi. How are you? Good. Uh, I may have missed it. I don't know. Uh, do you have a C6, uh, C6, C six uh, C axis in the super lattice as well? Yes, you do. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, that's what I was uh, referring here. You do uh, exchange the two sub lattices uh, in the presence of this uh, value symmetry that I mentioned before. Uh, you do have the symmetry. Yes. Sorry, so, I didn't see it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, as you probably seen many times in these uh, 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 lectures, right, this phase diagram has been not only reproduced, but also extended by several other groups. And uh, an interesting thing that has been emergent is other correlated phases that have been appearing besides the insulating and superconducting one. You've heard about uh, the ferromagnetic phase. Uh, I want to talk about another phase here, which is the pneumatic phase, okay? So let me show you here uh, what nematicity. First, let me define what it is, okay? And I will later go on the formalism on how to define it uh, mathematically. But for now, when I say nematic order, thinking, think that I broke the six-fold rotational symmetry to two-fold. In other words, excuse me, I lose uh, a three-fold rotational symmetry. So uh, the first uh, kind of experiment to see that was scanning tunneling microscopy. And I, I, I believe you saw this yesterday in the talk by Eva Andre. So uh, I'm showing here data. This is data here by the group of Apai Pasupati. So remember, in STM, what they are looking at is the local density of states, or is this a snapshot of the uh, electronic 
uh, the spatial distribution of the electronic states. And you see here that generically, uh, which is not surprising, right? I see that the, that the pattern here has the six-fold rotational symmetry here, right? I think it's very clear from this, oops, from this picture here, okay? But you see that uh, as they start moving away as they, from these uh, doping levels and they get close to the so-called half feeling, you lose this three-fold symmetry. In fact, you see what you see look like stripes. I'm trying to draw here so you see more clearly what it is, okay? These stripes here, I think are even more clear in the picture, in these pictures here by, in the, the paper in Eva Andre's group, okay? Uh, so you see very clearly the stripes. So the system no longer has a three-fold uh, rotation of symmetry, but it still has a two-fold rotation, okay? And this is a hallmark of nematic order. Okay? It's the breaking of this uh, three-fold symmetry. Now, these are local probes. It'd be nice if we had also a, a, a thermodynamic or transport evidence for uh, nematicity. Uh, uh, I'm sure that Pablo will tell you more about that on his uh, Friday's lecture. I just want to quickly uh, mention that this is indeed seen here. So uh, I will skip a lot of details and just say that uh, in, in, in this experiment, three-fold rotational symmetry breaking appears when this, X, uh, when this quantity here, the X, Y resistance corrected, uh, uh, is now zero. And you see that for a certain electronic concentration as function of temperature, it's always zero and then becomes non-zero. It goes back to zero here because there's a superconducting phase. So if you map now the phase diagram, you see this uh, uh, very nice defined region where there's an anisotropy here, okay? Uh, what was also even more interesting, or again, as interesting as this observation, was the fact that uh, you found a magic order inside the superconducting state. Okay. okay, so I hope I motivated you that it's an interesting problem to study nematicity in twisted bilayer graphene. There is experimental evidence for that. And that's what I'm going to do uh, in the rest of this lecture. I want you to touch on three different questions. Uh, First, as we discuss the nature of this nematic transition and this nematic phase. Then I want to discuss how it couples to the more super lattice. And I want more generally to understand if there is a difference in what we call nematic order in a rigid crystal uh, versus in a more super lattice. Okay. Any questions? All right. So now let's start uh, with uh, introducing these ideas in a more formal way. And uh, along the way, you see, uh, well, you know, let, let's start slowly here. So I need to go back to define what is electronic nematicity. You, you, you probably have heard before the word nematic. It comes from liquid crystals, okay? Now liquid crystals, you, you can think of these uh, uh, systems with these molecules here, these uh, 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 blue molecules, they're elongated rod-like molecules. And you know, there are two phases that are very known, right? A, a liquid phase, which is also called isotropic, and a crystal phase, which is obviously a solid phase. In the solid phase, you see that the center of mass of these molecules uh, are not translationally invariant, right? You break translational symmetry as in a, in a solid. And the orientation of these uh, molecules uh, is also fixed. You break both translational symmetry and rotational symmetry. In the liquid phase, you see that the center of mass now is completely disordered as in a liquid. And the orientation of the, uh, uh, of the rods is also completely uh, um, disorder in the sense that I don't have a preferred axis where all the molecules point. Now the beauty of liquid crystals, and this again is well understood in classical physics, is that you can have intermediate phases that are not liquid neither solid, okay? They are the liquid crystalline phases. And perhaps the most famous one is the nematic phase. Here, as you can see, the center of mass does not form any particular pattern. So you do not have uh, translational symmetry breaking. In other words, you do have full translational symmetry. But as you can see, the, this, these rods here, they more or less point in the same direction. So I have orientational order without translational symmetry breaking. 
Okay, so it's a property that is a mixture of a, of a liquid and a, and a solid. Now, before I extend this to, uh, uh, to actual electrons, electronic systems, I need to understand how I define an emetic order parameter. And this is what's going to be now the rest of this slide here. Uh, you may think that, well, all I need is, a, is an arrow, is a, is a direction, right? So we call it a director, you know, it's just a vector, if you wish. Cosine theta sine theta. But you soon realize that this cannot be your pneumatic order parameter. Because if I switch the, this, this uh, director, d goes to minus d, uh, I change my order parameter. But you see that the rod does not care if I'm pointing up or down. The, the rod is characterized the direction, the orientation of the rod is characterized by an arrowless vector. So it has to be the same whether this d points up or down. So this cannot be a good pneumatic order parameter. So what is, how do I write the pneumatic order parameter? Well, let's see. It is defined, I'm going, so let me discuss here how I properly define a pneumatic order parameter. And this will be important for when we discuss this in the case of, a, of an electronic system, okay? So the way to do that is actually to define a rank two tensor or a two by two matrix. And let me write the matrix and you understand why this is a good order parameter, okay? So this is, this is how it's defined, two di dj minus d squared delta ij, okay? And uh, again, di dj are just the components of d. Uh, if you want, it's probably easier to see how it looks like in an actual matrix form. So you have matrix element, you get dx squared minus dy squared in this diagonal, two dx dy in the two off diagonals here. And I get now dy squared minus dx squared, okay, in the uh, off diagonal. And just to be sure, I'm talking about a two dimensional pneumatic order parameter. This two dimensional really refers to the space of the pneumatic director, but uh, in any case, it's just for simplicity and to make the connection with the electronic case, okay? So um, when I write like this, you immediately see that this is a better order parameter than I had before, because if I change D to minus D, Q is the same, right? So that actually captures the main property of uh, this uh, pneumatic phase, okay? And moreover, let me just get more space here. So in particular, right, you could write this, uh, if I write specifically the components, I can write this as d squared cosine two theta, sine two theta, sine two theta, and minus cosine two theta, okay? And this d squared, I'm just gonna call q naught for uh, simplicity. Okay, so this is the order parameter and you see that I have two uh, 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 parameters that characterize it. One is this Q naught, which is an, a magnitude, and the other is this uh, angle theta, if you wish, which is the, direct, is the direction of the director, okay? Now, uh, some properties of this order parameter that we immediately see is that uh, tra this is a traceless order parameter, sorry, a traceless tensor. As you can see, if you take the trace, I get zero, and it is symmetric, qij is equal to qji. Okay. Uh, the other thing that, is, that you find is that uh, generically the trace of q to the power n is gonna be two times q naught to the power n if n is even, and zero if n is odd. So these are some of the properties of this order parameter. Now, what is, what is interesting is if I look at what happens if I want to calculate the uh, phase transitions to the pneumatic phase. Well, uh, I need to define the free energy, right? Or the Landau expansion. Right? So how do I do a Landau expansion? Well, 
This is a tensor, so your, your free energy cannot depend on, on the tensor. It can only depend actually on traces of powers of the tensor. So quite generically, you'd expect that your Landau free energy should be a sum of all these possible uh, traces here. Okay. But you see that the only ones that survive are the even ones. The odd ones are zero. So in this, in this sense, what you get for your free energy if you do an expansion to the leading powers, you get a over two q naught square plus u over four q naught to the power four, and so on. This is just the standard uh, Landau theory of uh, uh, um, of the standard phase transition that you learn. Okay, but what you see immediately is that this free energy does not depend on uh, the angle theta, right? It's completely independent. This means that when I have a nematic order, right? So when A becomes negative, right? That's when I, if I minimize this free energy, that's when I get a solution, right? You see that you fix this Q naught, but you do not fix the, uh, 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 but the phase can be whatever it wants. The, the angle can be whatever it wants. So we have a continuous symmetry, okay? That is broken in the ordered phase. And this continuous symmetry is nothing but related to this angle theta, okay? For this reason, uh, this kind of order parameter is also known as, uh, just a name I'm gonna use, is an XY-like uh, order parameter. It's just nomenclature that comes from uh, spin systems. XY is just to, to mean that uh, I have this continuous symmetry of an angle in the plane that I break uh, in the uh, nematic phase, okay? So this is very quickly how you define nematic order in liquid crystals. What happens, how do I generalize it for uh, electronic systems now, okay? uh, This goes back to this very uh, uh, influential paper uh, in 1998 by Kivelson, Fradik, and Emery. And uh, I'm going to define the following way. So let's, let's go back and write what my nematic order parameter was for the case of liquid crystals. And again, please stop me at any time if you want me to clarify something that I'm saying. This is how we define the nematic order parameter in uh, the liquid crystal case. How do I generalize this to a quantum mechanical operator in, a, in an electronic system? Well, the idea essentially is to replace the director Okay, to derivatives in the space of the uh, electronic operators. So essentially, what you do now the hat here is to mean that uh, it's an it's a, a quantum operator. I use the electronic creation operator here, right? This is just a standard quantum field operator that creates an electron position R, and then I replace the derivatives, sorry, the, the components of the director with derivatives, okay? So that's how I define it. And this here, I get psi of R, okay? So now this is a nice quantum mechanical operator. And uh, of course, the next question is, what does it mean? What does object mean? So let's see, the interpretation is actually not hard. Let's work this out. So uh, again, I can define this operator uh, in a matrix form. So I'm gonna just write here, oops. Just. So I'm just gonna write explicitly matrix form. I get, again, these derivatives, two dx dy, two dx dy, dy square minus dx square, psi. Okay. And what I'm interested in are the expectation values of this operator. And I'm gonna call these expectation values, as you can see, there are only two independent quantities here. I'm gonna call them phi one and phi two. So this is gonna be phi one, phi two, phi two and minus phi one, okay? And let me write down what these uh, are explicitly. So phi one, oops. Phi one is the expectation value of psi dagger R 
dx squared minus dy squared. And phi two is psi dagger r two dx dy psi r. Okay. So now I want to understand what this phi here means. What does it mean if uh, this expectation value is non zero? Well, what I'm going to tell you is that this here corresponds to quadrupolar charge order. Okay. So you probably already know that if I want to this to to uh, the quantum operator that is that uh, uh, introduces charge uh, density is uh, psi dagger r psi r that gives me the local charge. Okay, so this is always non-zero, of course. But phi is this charge operator. But now I have these form factors here. And my point is that these form factors here give you a, a quadrupolar charge order. And, and when they are non-zero, I break a symmetry of the system. To see that, let's consider the following example. Let's consider here uh, uh, free electrons, okay? So I'm gonna consider, I'm gonna ignore spins, okay? I don't need spins for what I'm gonna say, right? And uh, it's much easier. So I'm going to take the Fourier transform. So I'm going to introduce psi uh, k. So it's just a Fourier transform of the uh, creation operator. And if I have free electrons, you know very well, I get just you know a Fermi surface, and I get a no. I get, just get the usual dispersion of non-interacting electrons. Okay, so I can get that my Dispersion is just h bar squared k squared over 2m minus the chemical potential. Okay. And um, what I get then is that the electrons have, oops, it didn't really work the way I wanted. Okay, this is not uh, really collaborating here. Very good. Yeah, so if I have here. Uh, Yes, I have a, a Fermi surface. Now it looks like a Fermi surface, which is a circle. Uh, now let me add, let's say, okay, I have free electrons. And now for some reason, let's say they turn on interaction that uh, condenses one of these uh, order parameters, phi one and phi two. Well, I have to add them here in my uh, Hamiltonian. Now I'm gonna have phi one, sum over k. Now if I take the free transform, I will get psi dagger k, right? And if we transform is kx squared minus ky squared psi of k. Okay. So you clearly see my Hamilton is still uh, quadratic in the fermions. And so I get a renormalized uh, dispersion that is what I had earlier plus phi one kx squared minus ky squared. Okay. So then you immediately see now, okay, uh, what happened to my dispersion? Well, it used to be uh, a spherical, uh, sorry, a circular Fermi surface. But now when I add this term, obviously I get an ellipse, right? And this ellipse has its major axis pointing either along the y axis or along the x axis, depending on the sign of phi one. So you see, well, what happened? I broke a symmetry, right? My Fermi surface was isotropic. And now it becomes an ellipse. It means that I broke the rotational symmetry of the Fermi surface. Okay. So this is what the quadrupolar order does. Now you may ask, why do I need phi one and phi two? Why do I need two components? Well, let's go back a little bit and understand this point. So uh, it's actually convenient if, if you look here, okay, uh, you can rewrite this uh, as in terms of Pauli matrices, this becomes phi, phi one some Pauli matrix tau z plus phi two Pauli matrix tau x. So uh, usually then what we say is that in this uh, in this space of these Pauli matrices, okay, uh, what I get I can then define a two component order parameter, which is just going to be, so I usually associate this two component order parameter. I'm putting a double here to 
indicate that this is a bold quantity, bold phase quantity, with two components. Now, this does, this does not mean spin. This means two orthogonal directions in this uh, a pseudo space of directors. Okay. But let's see why I need them. Let's go back to my example here. Okay. I had these three electrons here, and I had just added phi one. Let's add both phi one and phi two. And let's see what happens. So I get sum over k, psi dagger k, psi k. Now I'm going to add both phi 1 and phi 2. So I'm going to write like this. I'm going to get sum over k, psi dagger k, phi 1, kx squared minus ky squared, plus phi 2 times 2 kx ky psi now, there is actually a very convenient way of rewriting this. You just notice that this quantity here can write as q squared cosine to theta k. This theta k means that it's a, a, a just angle in momentary space measure with respect to the k x axis. This here is k squared sine to theta k. And remember, I defined that pneumatic order parameter phi, right? Which was phi one, phi two was a two component order parameter in this abstract space. I might as well just parameterize in terms of two angles, cosine two theta, sine two theta. The two here is to ensure that, you know, I remember that uh, I only need to go from theta from zero to pi. If I just substitute it there where I wrote it, what you see is that my new uh, dispersion, right, is the uh, dispersion that I had earlier, the free dispersion. But now this second part here, you can see that it becomes phi k square cosine of 2 theta minus 2 theta k. Okay? You can just substitute it there. This is nothing but the equation of a generic ellipse. Okay? So uh, if I just draw here my Fermi surface, my ellipse here now can point in any, the major axis can point in any direction I want. Okay. Uh, this is, this, is the, the, this angle here is going to be theta. So this is the pneumatic director. Okay, something happened here, sorry. One second here. Okay. This is the pneumatic director. So here's the interpretation of the pneumatic director in an electronic pneumatic phase. Uh, it gives me the, uh, the ellipse here gives me, uh, um, gives me how the symmetry is broken, right? So uh, think about this. Uh, I had a circular Fermi surface, now it becomes elliptical, and uh, the axis of the ellipses can be anywhere that I want, okay? So this is how you translate these concepts from uh, uh, classical physics to this quantum systems. This kind of instability of the Fermi surface is also known as Pomeranchuk instability. Okay? So this is equivalent. So this is actually more precise than L equals two Pomeranchuk instability. Questions? Okay. So uh, this is what uh, then I just mentioned to you, right? This is how you define, so you, you define this uh, x, y nematic order parameter. If you write down the free energy, you get exactly what you got before, right? The free energy depends only on uh, the magnitude phi, but not on the angle theta. So in other words, I can break, I have a continuous symmetry to break. It has been widely explored of for a while now that this symmetry, right, is a continuous symmetry, so you get a Goldstone mode. And that this Goldstone mode couples directly to the electronic density and gives rise, can give rise to non thermodynamic behavior. But there's something missing here, and that's the fact that I have a crystal, okay? So let me explain what I mean by that. I've been pretending that the electrons just live in free space. But that's not really true. They live on a, on a crystal, right? Now let's take, for example, the case of a square lattice, right? 
you see, I can't really make any rotation that I want. The crystal is only invariant if I do rotations, for example, by 180 degrees or by 90 degrees. I can't really have an arbitrary rotation. In other words, my Fermi surface is not circular to start anyway. So, and I can just like distort in any way I want. So there has to be a restriction. And the key point that I want to make is that the crystal adds a, adds a term in your free energy. I'm gonna put here F crystal, then will depend on the angle of theta. And that distinguishes the electronic pneumatic from the standard pneumatic. To get this term, you can use group theory. Okay, I am not going to derive this, I'm just gonna give you the results. Let's start with, uh, uh, I'm gonna discuss the case of two different lattices here. Let me start with the square lattice, okay? So uh, this is what happens if you uh, uh, do this group theory analysis, you realize that the crystal gives rise to a term that is phi one square minus phi two square. Technically, for those of you that know group theory, all it means is that phi one and phi two uh, belong to different irreducible representations of the tetragonal group. So you get uh, uh, this expression here, and now you see that it depends explicitly on the angle of theta. And there are two possible uh, 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 values of, or there are two possible sets of values of theta. If gamma is positive, like shown here, then clearly I minimize it by having theta being plus or minus pi over four, or pi over four and three pi over four. And uh, so I have only two possible values for the pneumatic director. But if gamma is negative, the two possible values of the pneumatic are zero or pi over two, okay? But you see now that I went from having a freedom to choose this theta to be anything I wanted to just being two values. This is, when you have only two values, what you find out is that your order parameter is Eisen-like. So this is what we call eisen okay? Uh, I only have two possibilities. Now, I've been talking about uh, uh, pneumaticity in momentum space, but it's also very good to think of this in real space. So uh, if I think about what this kind of pneumatic does, is essentially a hopping anisotropy. So think of my site here, and it can hop into nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors. What these kind of pneumatic order does is make the hopping along the diagonal here different than along the anti-diagonal, okay? This kind of pneumatic here makes the hopping between nearest neighbors inequivalent. So it makes, let's say, this one here different than this one. Okay. So that's what, uh, if I just look the Fourier transform of that elliptical Fermi surface, that's what it means. Well, but now you see something very important, and that's another defining property of the pneumatic order, okay? What you see is that I know I broke a symmetry, right? If, when, I, when I draw like this, you immediately see that the lattice is no longer invariant under uh, changing by 90 degrees. Now it's only invariant if I do rotations by 180 degrees in both cases. So what I have actually in this case is uh, I'll necessarily have a structural distortion, okay? So this, this uh, hoppy anisotropy is gonna make this bone different than this bone, and if the bones are different, they do not have to have the same length. I'm choosing here the chosen bone to be uh, compressed, so you see that uh, this, uh, 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 this square here is distorted. These are, this means that I go from a square, from a tetragonal phase to an orthorhombic phase. Similar here, now the bones are along the horizontal or vertical axis, okay? So that's the one lesson that I want to emphasize that the metric order always triggers a structural distortion. What about in a triangular lattice? Well, you do again group theory, uh, you find out that there is this term allowed in your free energy, which may look complicated, but when you write these in terms of the parametrization in terms of the angles, you see that you get phi cubed cosine six theta. It's a cubic term, but you see now that you have, depending on the sine of gamma, you have three values for theta, right? Uh, and they are shown here, right? If gamma is positive, you, you, your theta values can be pi over six, 
pi over 2 and 5 pi over 6. Now, if gamma is negative, theta can be 0 pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. Okay? So you have three choices. A model that has three choices is uh, what we call three equivalent uh, choices. It's what we call a three state POTS model. So the universality class or the nature of this order parameter, the nematic order parameter in the triangular lattice is a three state POTS universality class. Now, this is not as widely studied uh, uh, in, uh, as IZ model, but it's very well studied. We know that in two dimensions, the three-state POTS model has a second-order phase transition despite having a cubic term, and it's very well understood. Okay? Uh, similarly to the case of the, uh, of the square lattice, uh, in, moment, in, in real space, this is translated as hopping and isotropies. So what, I, what you do is that you see you have three bonds connecting nearest neighbors, and you choose one of them to be different than the other two. So two bonds are equivalent and one is inequivalent. And you see, you're gonna get those stripe-like features that you saw in the STM data, okay? Notice that the two-fold rotational symmetries are preserved, meaning if I do C2X or C2Y, this is still invariant, okay? All right, any questions so far? Okay. Very good. So now that I introduced what nematic order is in general, I want to start applying to the case of Moray superlattices. So one thing that you also probably heard in this school before is that you always have a building strain and homogeneities in three-state bilayer graphene. Now strain right, will necessarily pull some of these uh, uh, bonds and will and may cause this uh, patterns that are very similar to the ones that the metric order cause. So one question that always is important when people discuss nematicity is, well, how do I distinguish an electronic nematic phenomenon from something that is just caused by some accidental or unintentional strain? Let me be more specific. Let's say that I, let me start with the tetragonal lattice case and then we go to the triangular one. So let's say that I apply strain along the y-axis here and let me apply compressive strain. So if you think about it, I apply compressive strain, I necessarily am choosing this nematic state over this one, right? Because this is the one that uh, whose bond order corresponds to uh, distorting the lattice in this way, right? In other words, what you see here immediately is that if you apply strain, you necessarily choose the nematic director to be along pi over two. And this will happen at any temperature because you broke explicitly a symmetry. In other words, the strain is ex breaks explicitly the same symmetry that the nematic order breaks spontaneously. So strain acts as a conjugate field to the nematic order in the same way as a magnetic field acts as a conjugate field to magnetization. If I had, instead of applying compressive strain, if I had stretched this lattice, right, or applied tensile strain, then obviously the only nematic order that I, or the nematic state that I necessarily induce is the one that has a, uh, 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 the y-axis is the long axis, and this corresponds to the director being along zero. In other words, when I apply strain the tetragonal lattice, I have no symmetries left to be broken in the nematic sector. So uh, in a tetragonal lattice, if I have strain, I, the, the best I can do is to find a crossover behavior, but I will not see a true nematic transition. What happens in the triangular lattice? It's a little bit different here. Let's say that I apply compressive strain along the y-axis. Remember, I had three different nematic ground states. Clearly, I'm gonna choose the one that has the y-axis, the shorter axis, which is this one. So when I apply compressive strain, I choose the director to be uh, this one, the pi over two. But if I apply tensile strain, 
the situation actually is very different. See, if I apply the inside string, I certainly do not want this ground state because I want the y-axis to be the long axis, but I have two different options, right? Both of them have the y-axis elongated, okay? And they can either, either of them can be chosen. So in other words, I have a residual symmetry that can be broken spontaneously, okay? So uh, when I apply tensile strain, I still can have an emetic related transition where one of the two directors is chosen, the one of the two directors left. Okay. So this is very different than the, the tetragonal case because it allows me to see a true phase transition even in the presence of strain. Okay, this was the picture. Now I want to introduce the formalism where we can understand these effects. Okay. So to do that, I need to introduce what is strain. And I'm going to do this uh, very quickly. So the idea is the following, right? Uh, if I have uh, uh, the quantity that I want to define before introducing strain is the displacement vector. Which I call U. Okay. And this displacement vector, if I have atoms at position R, I apply a displacement vector and I shift them to R teal. Okay. And this U can itself be a function of R. Now, one thing that we immediately recognize is the following. Let's think of a one dimensional case just for simplicity. Okay. Uh, let's say that I displace all the atoms by the exact same amount. In other words, this U is constant, okay? So I displace all of them here. Does it cost me any energy? Well, it doesn't, right? Because the energy comes, remember, I can I imagine that these um, uh, atoms are connected by these springs, right? But if I just replace the two ends of the spring, I didn't distort or I didn't uh, stretch the, the spring, so I don't pay any energy. So the only time I'm gonna pay energy is if uh, the, it's not a uniform uh, uh, this, uh, dislocation displacement of all the sides, but it's when a non-uniform, right? when I do something that, for example, this side I move here, this side I move much farther, this I move closer, and so on, right? Now my, now my, my, my springs are being uh, distorted and I'll pay energy. So this is just to tell you that the only thing that matters are derivatives of this quantity here, okay? So a derivative of this vector here, elements of this vector. And strain, the strain is a tensor the two, or a two-dimensional range two tensor. Okay. which is the symmetric combination of these derivatives. So it's DIUJ uh, plus DJUI, okay? So this is what uh, strain does, or this is how I, I define strain, all right? Now, uh, generically, right, if I have, just let, let's say that I have a, a sample, let's say that is in the shape of a square, it doesn't need to be, I have three different ways that I can strain it, right? I have epsilon x x, which is when I strain okay. along x. Yes. There is a question, Adrian. You can uh, ask your. Question. Hello. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. Hello. Sorry to interrupt you. I just have a question. Um, just to be clear, uh, is the nematic phase can create? I I don't understand the relation between. Uh, the, uh, the cause and the consequence, uh, I mean, is the nematic phase uh, is causing, the nematic order is causing strain, or is the strain is causing the nematic order? I don't understand the relation between. Right, them. so that's precisely what I'm trying. Yeah, it, it, that's the central question. And uh, so if I have an electronic nematic phase, it will necessarily cause strain, okay? okay now, yeah. The question is, what is the chicken and what is the egg, right? Uh, is the strain being caused by nematic order or is just a uh, 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 nematic order causing strain? Uh, what, I'm what I'm trying to tell you here, and I'm gonna make this a little bit more clear in the next slide, but let's go back so I can explain this again, is that even if you have strain, right? 
Uh, yeah. In the case of the triangular lattice, I can still have a phase transition. So if I see this phase transition, and I'll explain a little bit more what this phase transition is, that has to mean that uh, nematic order is the, is, the, is, the, is the driving force, okay? Okay, so, so, so yeah. So think of this, right? If I, if yeah. I have a, 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 it's a problem similar to if I have a magnet, right? Uh, and I apply a magnetic field. I usually apply a magnetic field to measure magnetization, right? But of course, if I apply a magnetic field, I induced a finite magnetization. So one way to distinguish, right, both is to calculate the response function. In other words, I apply a magnetic field, I measure the magnetization, and I see if the susceptibility diverges. You can do exactly the same for nematic. You can apply strain, measure a quantity that in this case usually is the resistivity and isotropy, and see if that diverges or not. So there are ways of distinguishing the stick and an egg, but this is a central problem. And what I'm trying to say here is that in the, in the triangular case, there is another way to distinguish these two scenarios. Does it, I'll get more to it in, in, in very shortly, but uh, does it give you an idea of where I'm going? Yeah, I understand better. So is uh, you trying to find a way to uh, separate uh, the strain which are from just a structural strain uh, and uh, the one from uh, nematic order. Yeah, so I, I want to be able to tell if when I see a distortion, if this is coming from some just, you know, some accidental strain that is present in the sample or it's really a signature of, okay, uh, uh, of nematic order. Yes, that's what I want to do. Okay, thank I'll, you. And I'll get to that answer very shortly, okay? Okay. Thank you. So um, anyway, there are three kinds, in, in the plane, there are three kinds of strain modes that I can have. I have XX, which is pulling or compressing along X. YY is pulling or compressing along Y. And I also have XY, which is the same as YX, which is pulling or compressing along the diagonals. Okay? Those are the three forms of strain that I can have, three components. Uh, just one example, right? If I had applied, uh, let me just do it here on the side. If I had just applied U to be some uniform or some non uniform a delta that changes this function of X along X hand, you see that the only component that is non zero is DX UX, which is delta. So this means that I get epsilon XX that is delta. And this is exactly what you would call the delta L over L, how much the uh, LX, how much the X direction is being compressed or, or uh, uh, expanded, okay? So this is the relative displacement. So delta positive means that I'm expanding. That's what I call tensile strain. Delta negative means that I'm compressing. This is what we call compressive strain. And you can, have, you can apply this along any direction. Now, how does this couple to nematic order? You can use symmetry, right? And I can write down the free energy. And my free energy actually will be, I'm gonna put a coupling constant lambda, it doesn't matter what it is. And the way that I couple it is phi one couples to xx minus y one. And phi two couples to two epsilon xy. That's the free energy. I think you can understand why these are the couplings, right? XX minus YY is the same as X squared minus Y squared, which was the form factor that I had earlier. But what you see immediately, right, is that there's a linearly coupled. So if I apply strain, I necessarily get nematic order, or if I have nematic order, I necessarily get strain. Okay. Now, uh, let me move this down a little bit. So if I apply strain, let me call the strain epsilon, which can be positive or negative, along some arbitrary direction n, okay? Could be anything, and this n makes an angle alpha with respect to the x-axis. Then you can actually, uh, uh, this becomes epsilon cosine two alpha, and this becomes epsilon sine of two alpha. You can show that. And now I use the fact that this phi one and two is phi 
cosine or sine of two theta, right? And then what you find is that a simpler expression, they get minus lambda phi epsilon cosine of two theta minus two alpha. Okay? So here's what you learn from this. If I have pneumatic order, so if I apply strain, I necessarily induce pneumatic order, right? They are linearly coupled. Now you also fix the direction of the director, right? So if lambda epsilon is positive, you minimize this by having theta equals alpha, right? So the director points the same direction as you are uh, applying strain. Now, if lambda epsilon is negative, then you see that theta is gonna be alpha plus pi over two. That's how you minimize this term. So then the director points in a perpendicular direction to uh, strain. Now, let's go back to what I discussed about the uh, the, the, tri the, the triangular case and see what this implies. Well, let me just look at the part of the free energy that depends on theta, right? I had this part here, which exists without strain. And now I have this new part. Let's say that I'm applying strain on purpose, okay? I have this part here. Let's see what their interplay does for us. I'm gonna consider a, a special case or a definite case where gamma is positive and lambda is negative, okay? Just for the time being. Now, if gamma is positive, I minimize this term here by having theta be one of three values, right? Pi over six, pi over two, or uh, five pi over six. Now, what about the second term here? Well, now it depends on lambda epsilon being positive or negative, okay? Let's say that I apply compressive strain. Oops. Compressive strain, okay? So I'm, uh, I'm compressing my sample. Then, well, lambda is, is negative, epsilon is negative, so overall I get a positive sign and a minus in front. So uh, I minimize theta to be alpha. So let me say now for concreteness that I'm applying strain along the y-axis, okay? So theta is gonna be pi over two. Well, what you see is that the same value of theta minimizes both terms. So I'm going to essentially, when I apply strain, compressive strain, my director is fixed and it's not gonna change its function of temperature. Suppose now that I apply tensile strain, epsilon positive, so I stretch my sample. Now, I want to minimize by having theta equals zero, right, perpendicular to alpha. But this is not a minimum here. None of these are minimum. Actually, quite on the contrary, theta equals zero is a maximum, as you can see from here, right, of the first term. So now you have a competition. What happens? Well, it depends on on the value of phi, right? This is linear phi, this is phi cube. So if I'm at high temperatures when phi is small, I suspect that this term here wins and I'm gonna get theta equals zero. As I go down temperature, if I have a, if I would have an emetic transition no matter what, this phi is gonna start increasing. And at some point I need to satisfy this term too. And I can just put theta equals zero because that's the maximum energy I pay here. So what you're trying to do is move your theta towards one of these two other uh, uh, um, director values. Because again, pi over two, if I, if I try to do pi over two, I have to pay too much energy in this guy, but pi over six and five pi over six is a good compromise. So what the director starts doing, if I, if I have a plot here, and if I plot theta, as a function of temperature, what I expect to happen is that I start here at zero, right? And at some temperature, when this term becomes relevant, I have to choose between pi over six and, well, five pi over six is the same as minus pi over six. I have to choose among one of the two. So you see, I have a spontaneous symmetry breaking. I have to choose among one of the two. And I do have a phase transition. This is the phase diagram that you expected in this model, okay? If you apply compressive strain, nothing happens. In other words, it's always the rector pointing along zero. 
But if I apply comp a tensile strain, the director should move from zero and start moving towards one of these two, but I have to choose among one of the two, so I have a broken symmetry. We call this a uh, 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 nematic flop transition because the director flops, similar to what happens in some spin systems. Okay. Now, uh, going back now to the question that Adrian asked, how, how can this prove that, I, that, that the strain is not causing anything? Very simply, right? Remember, if you look at, at this phase diagram here, right? This is the nematic transition if I didn't have any strain. If I didn't have this transition, if I apply strain, all is going to happen is that my, my director is going to orient with this strain. Okay, so it's going to either point along one direction or another. But if I, had, if I were to have an nematic transition, even in the absence of strain, what's going to happen is that this director is going to start rotating. Okay? And this rotation, even though the strain is fixed in one direction, this, the director is rotating. And that's how I can distinguish that this is a, 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 a nematic phenomenon, not a strain phenomenon. Is it clear? So more, you know, if, if you look, what we'll be looking at is that in the case of compressive strain, you see the bones just becoming stronger and the distortion becoming stronger, as a function of temperature. But in the other case, you see that uh, I have here uh, tensile along uh, uh, the y-axis here. And then at some temperature, I start compressing either this bond or this bond. You see what happened? What symmetry I broke? Well, in this case here, the three bonds are in equivalent. Here, two of the bonds are equivalent. This inequivalence means that I no longer have that C2X and C2Y symmetry, right? If I rotate along this axis, I no longer get the same thing. So that would be the signature of this transition experimentally would be the breaking of the C2X or the C2Y symmetry. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. So I'm going to quickly talk about uh, the case of fluctuating strain. So uh, I discussed what happens when you apply strain, but you have to keep in mind that strain um, fluctuations exist no matter what. And of course, cost energy, because otherwise my, my, my uh, lattice will just distort. Uh, the coefficient, this is just a har uh, glorified harmonic oscillator and this are just elastic constants. In the case of the triangular lattice, there are only two independent elastic constants that we call C11 and C12. And this is how the elastic energy, this is the, this is the uh, uh, expression for the elastic energy. Okay? It's quadratic in the strain, and it only depends on these three modes here. Now, you can take the, you can remember that uh, these are derivatives of the displacement vector. So you can write this, oops, in terms of the displacement vectors, and you get this matrix here. Okay. This is called the dynamic matrix. And what you immediately see is that if I want to calculate the normal modes of these oscillations, right, the eigenvalues of this matrix, all there are two of them, and they are proportional to Q. They're all linear in Q, right? Because they'll have Q squared in front of it, or sorry, Q squared. So what are these normal modes if I diagonalize this matrix? They are precisely acoustic forms. Okay, so you have the eigenvectors, they're the polarization of the phonons, and then you get also the phonon dispersion. So this mu, mu is just an index for the eigenvalues one and two, and they will be given by the square root of lambda mu over uh, the density of the material, which you usually write as a velocity times Q. This is the sound velocity. Okay? So just diagonalize this matrix. So in the case of the triangular lattice, you actually get something very simple. You get a purely longitudinal mode, so the, the, the polarization is longitudinal, or a transverse mode, and the velocities go as the square root of the elastic constants. Here is just a picture of these longitudinal and transverse modes in just monolayer graffiti. Now, because, so what it means here is that, oops, let's keep in here, okay. 
Uh, remember, the strain couples linearly to nematic order parameter, which means that there is a direct interaction between nematic and acoustic phonons. So if you integrate out these acoustic phonons, you get, so this is now in the disorder state, I'm considering these strain fluctuations. What it causes is long range uh, uh, interaction between the nematic order parameters, like here. Okay. Now this may look complicated, but if you look in Fourier space, this actually looks much simpler. What it does is that it projects the nematic onto this uh, uh, form factor here in momentum space. And there's a coefficient that, it, that whose sign depends on which velocity is larger, the transverse or the longitudinal. So what it means? Well, let's say that I want to approach the phase transition, right? So I, I wrote the expression of the nematic susceptibility. So I'm gonna send the nematic susceptibility to infinity. So uh, R0 goes to zero. The momentum has also to go to zero. But you see that this term here tells me that not all directions will give me a, a, a divergent susceptibility. These are directions in momentum space. In particular, if this here is a, a, a positive, which is the case if the transverse velocity is smaller than the longitudinal velocity, then the only directions that will uh, where you're going to see a divergent susceptibility are these two directions here, plus or minus pi over four with respect to the, to the director. Now, if this was negative, meaning transverse velocity is larger than longitudinal velocity, the two directions that become soft or, where the pneumatic susceptibility diverges are parallel and perpendicular to the pneumatic direction. Now, this, what it does is that it makes the phase space restricted because I don't have all directions and it causes, we expect this to uh, cause the transition to become mean field in first order. But there is more to that. Now there are only some directions that become uh, uh, soft. So if I want to know what are the uh, uh, electronic states that exchange pneumatic fluctuations the most, I have to look at what states on the Fermi surface are connected by this vector, right? So these are the states connected by this vector, for example. Now I want Q to go to zero, so I need to start reducing this vector. So I find that the states that will exchange mostly the, 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 the states that will be coupled by this low energy fluctuations are the ones near the so-called hotspots. So I have two possible vectors and I have them therefore four hotspots. I chose the director to be along zero, this first simplicity, okay? If I had the other uh, situation where the transverse velocity is larger than the longitudinal velocity, then what you see is that the, the hotspots now move to these directions here, okay? So these are the points of the Fermi surface where I expect the strongest impact of pneumatic fluctuations on electronic properties. But remember, this is how the coupling was between the electrons and the pneumatic order parameter. Remember, I had this form factor here. So if I look at theta equals zero, right, which is my director that I'm, uh, I'm focusing right now, you see that there are points of the Fermi surface where this coupling constant vanishes, this form factor. These are called the cold spots because they're essentially uncoupled from the furnace and they are these four here. Well, that's a problem because now if I have the transverse velocity being smaller than the longitudinal velocity, the hot spots coincide with the cold spots, which means that essentially there is a decoupling between the low energy pneumatic fluctuations and the electrons. This is exactly what happens in the eyes in the pneumatic case, by the way. Now, the other situation where the transverse velocity is larger than the longitudinal velocity, I get these hot spots here. This means that not only I'm not coinciding with the cold spots, but I'm as far as I can from them. It's actually when I have the maximum coupling between the low energy pneumatic fluctuations and the electrons. That's a case where I expect to see the strongest impact of pneumatic fluctuations on electronic properties. So the question is, which velocity is larger, the transverse and the longitudinal. If you have, sorry, uh, okay. If you have a rigid lattice, 
you have no choice. The transverse velocity is always smaller than longitudinal velocity. That's a condition of stability of the lattice. And it means that the, in the rigid lattice, electrons are nearly decoupled from low energy in the matter of fluctuations. But here's the key point. The Moret super lattice is not a rigid lattice. This is formed by the adhesion potential between the two layers. And this adhesion potential prefers to have AB stacking over AA stacking. So it forms, it's, it's this emergent lattice. And it turns out that, you know, these two papers by Koshino and Ochoa, they calculated this and they saw that in twisted bilayer graphene, the transverse velocity is actually larger than the tuna velocity. And again, this is not possible in a rigid lattice, but in this case it is, okay? So here is the key point. In the Moran super lattice, the electrons are maximally coupled to low energy nematic fluctuations, and this cannot happen or you don't expect it to happen in a rigid crystal. To finish, let me just tell you why, why this is the case. Well, as I told you, this is, a, this is this emergent lattice. In a regular crystal, it doesn't cost you any energy if you rotate the crystal. Rotations are the anti-symmetric combination of this, of this uh, uh, point of view, okay? These are the, this is the, the rotation tensor. Omega xy is rotation with respect to the z-axis. But because I have this adhesion potential connecting the two layers, it costs me energy if I want to rotate them. So I have to pay rotation energy, which doesn't happen in rigid crystals. If you now go back oops, and calculate the new velocities uh, or the new phonon dispersions, you see that there is still get a longitudinal and a transverse phonon, but this cost of having, uh, uh, um, this cost of having rotations increase only the transverse velocity. So if this is large enough, which happens to be the case in graphene, and that comes from the adhesion potential, then the transverse velocity will become larger than longitudinal velocity, and you see this new effect. Okay, I'll just leave you with my conclusions. I hope this lecture uh, motivated the why, first of all, this general idea of what is nematic order, and how uh, it is different in different lattices, and how in a more super lattice, things are even more special than in a rigid crystal. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rafael. So we have a few minutes for questions. And the first one I see is Zui Tao. Let me allow you to talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you for the talk. I have a question on the residual icing symmetry. That slide. So which one? The the residual icing symmetry. So when you talk about you, if you have a triangular lattice and you apply, even if you apply a string along one direction and you still have two equivalent direction that you can go through the nematic phase transition. If I understand. Okay. Let me go this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is, what if the string is not along the, the high symmetry direction, say if it's uh, very complex? Very good. Um, uh, absolutely. This is a very good question. So what's going to happen? Let me go back here. Um, I think this will, uh, this will explain a little bit more what happens. So remember here that I, I told you that if I plot theta's function of temperature, right, the, the director, right, mm -hmm. uh, I will see you know, a very sharp onset, right? Mm -hmm. If the string is not aligned along one directions, or one of the high symmetry directions, then what's going to happen is that I'm gonna choose one of them. So the picture is probably gonna be something like this, okay? Right, I no longer will have a phase transition. But what will happen is that your, your director is gonna still move quite a bit as function of temperature, right? It's gonna start here, Right, and as I go, so this is where it starts at high temperatures, and I start going to move towards this direction here. So I'm going to see a rotation of this nematic director. Okay, so okay. this would be this would not this would not be possible if if just if it just had static strain, right? This rotation of the director has to be a consequence of nematic order. Mm -hmm. But then, okay. even if you have a rotation of the um, nematic order, is 
is there still a continuous phase transition? No, the then there's no true phase transition. Okay. No, we only have a crossover. Thank you. Yeah. So by the way, uh, this was one of the arguments that uh, with the paper of Pablo, and, as, and I think Pablo will mention these experiments on Friday, that we used to make a case that this was a, 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 an actual spontaneous nematic order and not uh, 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 just strain. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. No problem. Okay, are there any more questions? Let me see. So we are a little bit past the time where, but if there's any question, please go ahead and ask. Okay, we have one question. Said you have, I'm gonna allow you to ask question yourself. Okay, said you, please go ahead. Hi, Professor. So is the nematistic in this uh, traced bilateral graphene interaction driven? And it seems that in the experimental paper, the nematistic is specifically associated with the superconductivity. But like above TC, do you also expect to see nematicity and uh, are they related or are they independent orders? So let me ask, let me answer these two questions. One thing that I really didn't have time to talk about uh, was what are the mechanisms and yes, is interaction driven? Uh, I think one way of understanding that is looking at these SU4 effective models. Uh, nematic order corresponds to some order in these effective orbital degrees of freedom or valid degrees of freedom. Uh, so yes, it is absolutely uh, 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 interaction driven and there's still different debates on how you get this mechanism. This is one of them, okay? Which I unfortunately don't have time to explain more, but it comes from, you know, this additional SU2 degrees of freedom. It's a combination of the spin and values. Now about the, the experiment, whether it's superconductivity or not. So uh, uh, let me show you here. So this phase here, certainly breaks through fold rotation of symmetry and it's not superconducting, okay? Now, is it an emetic phase in the sense that does, or does it break other symmetries such as translation of symmetry and so on? We don't know, okay? All we know is that it breaks through fold rotation of symmetry. We don't know if other symmetries are broken. Now, there is also an emetic superconducting phase. It's a separate, a different phase. Now, what I wanted to tell you is that there is a possibility that is very interesting, which you did not have time to talk about, which is called vestigial nematicity, which would be this region here where you see a nematic order that is different than the one in the normal state and seems to border the superconducting state above TC. This is a concept called vestigial phase. And uh, I mean, I'll be happy to give another one hour and a half lecture only on that, but uh, I think everybody's tired. But uh, uh, yes, so you do see nematic, you do see threefold rotational symmetry breaking above TC and there could actually be two different normal state nematicities. Does it, does it answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, is there any other question? If not, let's uh, thank uh, Rafael again. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Pablo, and uh, have a good day. <laughs> thank you. And then I uh, will see you all in a moment in the poster session. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, Pablo. And I'm going to end the meeting now. I'll see you in the poster pitch session. Bye. Okay.